Well, we are so happy to have you folks with us today. Uh, we just, over the summer, wrapped up the series on the armor, the spiritual armor and spiritual warfare. And I want to thank Nicole for the fine job she did last weekend as she wrapped up that series. I, I've always looked at this weekend after Labor Day as the beginning of the church year. Now, that's unofficial. They say the church year begins with Advent, but I always feel like it's when school starts up in September. And I'm flashing back to 1998 when I first came here in September. And some of what I'm sharing with you today goes back almost that far. Um, but I, I, have a, I don't need an app on my phone to tell me how many weeks or months or days till retirement because I've got Linda and she keeps that before me pretty regularly. But uh, I'm conscious that this is my last fall with you guys. And um, I'd like to launch a new series this fall, beginning with today. Um, and I'm calling it Back to the Basics. And it's some basic elements of who we are over these last 21, going on 22 years. And uh, some of it will be repetitive. You'll be very familiar with it. A little bit of it's new, new to me in the last couple of months. And I think that part will be new you but um we're excited uh to launch this fall season together and um one of the things that i came to pen Ave with that i shared right from the get-go was one of my little acronyms t-e-a-m spells team and that means together everyone achieves more say that with me together everyone achieves more if you haven't discovered your your notes that follow my message, uh, write that down if you would. Together, everyone achieves more. Since I've been here in the fall of 98, uh, we've had a commitment to the Great Commission, and that's not unique to me or us, but that is the basis for who we are as a church. But I'd lift the Great Commission up to you today as our memory passage, and would you read that with me if you have it in front of you in your notes or you see it on the screen? Let's together... Remember the words of the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And I hope you know where the Great Commission is. Where is it? Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. So this reestablishes that we are about making disciples. That's what Jesus told us to do 2,000 years ago. Our business is making disciples. And so I would ask as we begin this new season, how's business? We need to continue to be making disciples. Um, something that, that the new part uh, for me, and I trust for you, for many of you, is something that I just came across this summer in my reading. And... Um, it's called Set Theory. And I noticed this was written back originally in 1978. It was uh, uh, just about when I was beginning as a pastor. Uh, Paul, I don't know if that's Heber or Hebert, but the article is entitled Gospel in Context. And uh, Mr. Heber introduced, a, introduced what he called the bounded set versus centered set theory. And it's a new way of thinking, new to me, and relatively new in a 2,000-year history of the church. Um, and it's really come to shape the direction that I, in the, my, my thinking about our ministry and any church's ministry. Um, this last winter, the United Methodist denomination had their general conference. They had a special general conference that has left us more in a state of uncertainty than we were before. I think they thought it was going to clarify. And now this next year, in 2020, there will be the regular general conference. And so a lot of things are in upheaval, and we're not sure what the future holds. But I think this bounded set versus center set concept helps us look at that as well. So you'll see a couple of simple diagrams in your notes. And on the left, you see bounded set. And I'd like you to imagine a farmer with, say, three or four acres. And he has sheep or cattle or a combination of livestock. And he's able to build a fence around his farm. And that determines his bounded set. You know, the animals stay inside the fence. And the animals that are not his stay outside the fence, in theory. And um, 
by building the fence, he determines uh, the boundaries, you know, who's in and who's out. And um, very important, if you apply that to a church, would be the membership of the church. Who are the members and who aren't the members? And um, very original concept of church has often been bounded by definition like that. Now, the centered set, you'll see uh, the center there is the cross, the cross representing Christ. But uh, this would be like a rancher who has several hundred or a thousand acres, and it's not practical to build a, f a fence around all that many acres. And so what he does is he digs a well. And if there's a well central to it, that would be the cross. Uh, the animals aren't going to stray too far away from where they need to go to get a drink. And so instead of the fence, it's centered around the well. And the centrality of Jesus Christ is so important. And, and that means that um, in the context of us as a church, if we live lives that honor Christ and we are Jesus with skin on, people are going to want to be around us and they're going to come without fencing them out or fencing them in. Does that make sense? Now, to support that, um, C.S. Lewis, didn't, he didn't contribute to this set theory because he died in 1963. But he said this, uh, the situation in our world is complicated. The world does not consist of 100% Christians and 100% non-Christians. There are people, a great many of them, who are slowly ceasing to be Christians, but who still call themselves by that name. Some of them are clergymen, he said. <laughs> there are other people who are slowly becoming Christians, though they do not yet call themselves Christians. There are people who do not accept the full Christian doctrine about Christ, but who are so strongly attracted by Christ that they are his in a much deeper sense than they themselves even understand. And so that's where I'm headed with this centered set kind of a thinking. Now, one of the original contributors to this uh, set theory said this. For us, the center should be Jesus himself. The gospel is the central imperative for Christian mission. Since at the core of a centered set is Christ, we have the cross in the middle, a church should be concerned with fostering increasing closeness to Jesus and the lives of all those involved. We believe that a centered set church must have a very clear set of beliefs rooted in Christ and Christ's teaching. This belief system must be non-negotiable and strongly held on to by the community closest to its center. A centered set church is not concerned with artificial boundaries that bounded set churches have traditionally added. In bounded set churches, all sorts of criteria are determined by the acceptance or rejection of prospective members. Parenthesis, smoking, drinking alcohol, living together outside marriage, differing views on Christ's return. I could add some other more contemporary examples. In a centered set church, it is recognized that we are all sinners, all struggling to, the be to be the best people we can be, but we also believe that the closer you get to the center, that is Christ, the more Christ-like one's behavior should become. Therefore, core members of the church will exhibit the features of Christ's radical lifestyle, such as love, generosity, hospitality, forgiveness, mercy, peace, and others. Those who have just begun the journey toward Christ and those whose lives may not exhibit such traits are still seen as belonging. No one is considered unworthy of belonging because they happen to be addicted to tobacco, because they're not married to their live-in partner, etc. Belonging is a key value. The growth toward the center of the set is the same as what we call discipleship. Isn't that good? I think that's what we need to be. We don't need to try to define every little detail, but if we, Jesus said this, if, he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all people unto me. So growing toward Christ is what I would uh, share with you. Now that's new thinking. Like I say, it's 40-year-old thinking, but for me it's new. And I hope it's uh, 
revolutionizing for us as we think about this. Now, before I came here in 1998, I had a year in which I, I got to visit Rick Warren's Saddleback Church. And I have a book, uh, The Purpose Driven Church, going back to 1997 or 98. And he actually autographed it and wrote me a little couple lines in there. And, you know, um, but I took out of that book a couple things. One of them we know very much about the ball diamond. Uh, the other one that we haven't focused on quite as much is what we call the concentric circles. And I included that in your program, in your notes there. Um, you see those circles there. And I would suggest to you, though Rick Warren didn't refer to the centered set, that's essentially what we're looking at here. And so if you allow me to re-remind you about those circles, and a lot of what I'm going to do from this point on I share with Membership 101 classes, but uh, many of you haven't been in a membership class in a long time, so I'd like to lift this up to you. And those circles, starting from the outside in, first of all, you see community. And they are the people not yet part of our church family, but the community we live in. At Pine City on Sunday morning, while we have worship in the sanctuary, there's a couple hundred people uh, a few blocks away down at Chapel Park having worship as they play softball, so to speak. They're part of the greater community, but they're not part of our church family by any stretch of the imagination. Um, we consider ourselves as be kind of a regional church. We have people that come from the northern tier of Pennsylvania or all around Shimon County to, to our campus in Pine City uh, and Southport and Elmira and Pine City or Wells uh, uh, Webb Mills or uh, Wellsburg, places like that. You folks at Miracle Mile, now you're situated in Elmira Heights by, by postal cold, but you're kind of horse heads. You're relating to people right around the Miracle Mile, and you have some people that come from the Heights or horse heads or Elmira or other places, but your community is basically around Miracle Mile. You, you guys in Watkins, you're there in Watkins, but you draw people from Yates County, meaning Penyan or Dundee, Tyrone, or up the other side of the lake from them, like Burdett or Hector, uh, Montour Falls. Uh, we have people coming from a, a fairly wide range there. Not to mention people that might discover us on the internet. You know, I just got a phone call today from somebody who had very carefully read the, the website for Miracle Mile. And he knew more about it than I knew just because he just read it. And he called up and says, hey, I want, I'm thinking of coming this Sunday. I just wanted to talk to you, you know. And so we, we find that we can reach out in our community in different ways like that. So that's the outer circle. The next circle in, we call the crowd. Those are the, we, sometimes we lo lovingly refer to them as the Christers, Christmas and Easter. If they're looking to go to church, they're feeling kind of motivated in those holy times of the year. We're the church that they would consider. So they're part of our crowd. Also, if there's a wedding or a baptism or a funeral, we're the ones they would tend to think of. You know, and, and in my 21 years here, I've got quite a, a, a network of people that know me, even though I don't know them. You know, and so I'm blessed to have an opportunity to serve them when we get that opportunity. The next circle is called the congregation. And those are the people, maybe we don't see them every weekend, but if they go to church, we're the one they're going to go to. And they may come every week or they may come once a month or one or every two or three weeks. Um, they're our congregation. They're the ones that have showed by a little bit higher level of participation uh, that they, they would be considered to be in that congregation circle. And then the next circle in is the committed. And those are people that have taken a step beyond occasional attendance, beyond membership 101, Maybe they've taken 201 discipleship or 301 and 401 uh, ministry and mission. Um, they've become more regular in their financial support and their stewardship. And so those are the committed people. And then at the very center of those circles are, are what we call the core. And those are the, the leaders, the keepers of the church culture, if you will, of the DNA. They're the ones that would be in the, the center of that centered set because they're trying, not that they're perfect, but they're trying their best to center their lives around 
Jesus Christ. That would include our leaders, our dream team members, our campus leaders, people like that. So you could be thinking about which of those circles you might place yourself. But I, I just wanted to share that set theory in the context of these concentric circles, you know, and I hope I haven't lost you or bored you too much there. Now, back to the purpose of the church, and this purpose, does it surprise you that I have an acronym for it? I came to PAUMC with this acronym. I had developed it the year before coming here, and um, I remember it would not have been in 98. It probably was sometime in 1999, that I first kind of cautiously tried this out on people. Uh, how many of you were around back in 98 when I got here? Raise your hands. Uh, um, there, there's, a, there's a few of you, and uh, not a lot, really. But um, I introduced this, and I kind of threw it out as a trial balloon. Let's see how this purpose thing flies. And I tried it a couple times, and then I think we had some kind of a leadership retreat or something. I said, what do you think about this? Could we make this a basis for who we are and I got enough affirmation that I have since incorporated it in every membership 101 class that we, that we lead. And so I would just uh, review this purpose acronym because uh, it's part of who we are. And yet some of you that it's been so long since you did a 101 class, you might have, we don't, I, don't, I don't use this all the time. But P in the word purpose stands for, read that with me, present Christ to the lost. And we have systematically realized that there could be lost people in our midst in every service, you know, that we don't just assume that because you're here, uh, I was going to say sitting on the pews, but in Pine City now or at Miracle Mile, you got some pretty nice chairs to sit on, don't you? Um, I can't just assume that because you're in church that you're a Christian, you know, that you've really been found by Jesus Christ. One of my corny illustrations, please forgive me because you've heard this before. No, just because you're at McDonald's, does that make you a Big Mac? If you happen to be in a garage, does that mean you're a car? Just because you're in church, does that mean you're a Christian? No. So we need to realize that there are lost people in our midst, and they matter to us. Lost people matter to God. Say that with me. Lost people matter to God. So I try, we try to have regular invitations for people to invite Jesus Christ into their life. And we've had a few occasions when I've known people have attended for years, and then suddenly I'll notice on the back of that Let's Connect card, um, I'm deciding today to invite Jesus Christ to be my Savior. Praise God. Why does it, it's a mystery how that all happens. But we continue to make the invitation. If you allow me to use the example of, a, um, I just, Amanda got married, and I have a son-in-law who wants to get me to go fishing with him. And I haven't given in yet, but maybe next year in my retirement. But I do remember as a kid throwing my line in the water. And whatever the bait was, do you just try once? You know, I, it's kind of more active to have a lure. And you keep throwing the lure out there. It may be the umpteenth time before the fish takes the bait. But does it, does it mean you stop throwing it out there? Well, we keep throwing the bait out there and we make the invitation and it's up to that person and God when they decide to bite, so to speak. So we continue to present Christ to the lost. U stands for, read, read that with me, unite people in celebrative worship. It's so important that there's a sense of unity when we're gathered together. More important than the style of worship is the unity that people sense, you know, and and when they come and they know these people get along with each other and they sense there's a, a, a unity, it doesn't have to be uniformity. Not everybody's the same. Uh, sometimes I say we don't have to be cookie cutter Christians, you know, just like everybody else. But we have that desire for Jesus Christ to be central in our lives. I loved it when somebody said to me last year on a Saturday night, I think it was, after he was new to the church, he said, these people really love the Lord. And that was obvious to him just by worshiping with us. So there's a unity that comes when we worship in, in sincerity. And it's not perfect, but there's a spirit of celebration. And um, not yet Christians. You know, I'd rather say that uh, rather than say unchristians, I'd say not yet Christians or pre-Christians. 
they feel that unity and they feel a sense of celebration and they often want what they experience. They see somebody that loves the Lord that's worshiping. I want to be like that. I want what they have, you know, and it's as much caught as it is taught and that then lost people can be found. And uh, lukewarm Christians can become fired up Christians as we worship together. And uh, those people love the Lord because they act like they believe it. They live like they believe it, and that makes all the difference. So that's P, that's U. Now R stands for restore wholeness. Wholeness, rec re recovering wholeness and healing is most often a gradual process. It's not like the light switch where you turn it on and suddenly the light comes on and you're whole and you're healed, but it's often a gradual process. Uh, we need to be made strong in the broken places, and that takes some vulnerability, and it takes some tender loving care on the part of those around the hurting person. Uh, the restor restoration needs to be more than a surface, kind of a cosmetic thing. I think of the times my brother and I got out of hand as teenagers. And uh, I think one time I was the older brother. He was a little smaller than me. I might have pushed him into the bedroom wall and we left a big dent in the wall board there. Now, the temptation was to just paper that over, you know, and there, there would be the hole, but you wouldn't see it. I mean, right away. But that's not what you need to do to restore wholeness. You need to go back and you got to fix what's broken. And that's a, a complicated process you know and if it's drywall you do the drywall and then you got to go back and mud it a few times and get it just right before you can paint it um, a few weeks ago I talked about uh, shellfish like things like shrimp or or crabs or lobsters crustaceans I called them um, Sarah Height has a biology major she came along and explained uh, that the shells that those shellfish have are technically called exoskeletons. You know, maybe I knew that, but I might have forgotten. And a way that those shellfish grow is they grow so big within the shell that they have, and then they have to shed that shell to grow another shell. And that's part of this res restoration of wholeness. When we go through that process, we're very tender. We're very vulnerable, but... Uh, we can help each other. Together, everyone achieves more. We can encourage wholeness to be produced as we uh, help people to restore wholeness. The next P in the word purpose stands for provide. And I've often looked at that as well. Sure, that's my gimmick to get to the rest of the letters. But provide is important. Um, it means that we give people the gift of, of our love for them um, we present the gospel to them and that is our present to them we don't charge admission to come to church but we offer the free gift and there is no cost but it costs the lord everything as i say that i remember a few verses uh, three verses in the beginning of isaiah 55 where god says through isaiah come all of you who are thirsty, come to the waters. You who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me. Eat what is good and you will delight in the riches of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. And so, we provide this opportunity for people and we don't charge for it, but we love, we have been loved by God and the Bible says we love because he first loved us. So we offer that at no cost to provide for people. And uh, then the O, opportunities. We provide opportunities. Um, that means that we have the desire to give away the ministry. Nobody has special turf that they can protect. You know, well, that's just not... I'm in my 40th year as a pastor, and I've seen there's a few areas in churches where people are very protective. One of them is the kitchen, you know, and boy, don't mess with the whoever the, usually it's a lady, don't mess with so-and-so. She's got that kitchen thing. You don't want to step on her toes. I've seen things like that. Other areas are music and worship and things like that. Thanks be to God, we don't have that attitude, but we want to provide um, 
We want to be permission giving as compared to permission withholding. And that's one of the things we've emphasized over these years is nobody gets to protect their thing just because they've always done it that way. Uh, but we want to make room for new people to feel like they can be involved as well. So that's where the word opportunities comes to play. Opportunities for what? Well, first of all, for service. Um, when we have Membership 101 class, we don't go into great depth talking about what is your spiritual gift for ministry. But we say, we do want you to try some uh, starter ministries, we call them. Things like uh, being a greeter, welcoming people, uh, various aspects of hospitality, maybe helping to make the coffee or clean up, off the, clean up after the coffee hour. Or we have gift bags at all of our campuses to put those gift bags together, etc. Um, not always spiritual things, but ways you can serve and, and get your feet wet. Um, I'm just thinking about you guys at both uh, Miracle Mile and Watkins. Uh, there's no spiritual gift called lawn mowing, but I know there's a need at both of your locations for people to keep the lawn mowed or to pull the weeds in the garden or to plant flowers. I hate to bring up this next one, but there's the S word that comes in the winter. You know, uh, Snow removal is going to hold true at, at both of your campuses. So, are there things that you can do to get your hands dirty, to get involved that we might call starter ministries? So we provide opportunities for service while, and then the last part, read that with me, equipping fully developing followers of Jesus Christ for ministry. Beyond the starter ministries comes the opportunity to be equipped for more in-depth ministry. And I'd like to read uh, from my Bible as you you read from the notes in your, uh, in your uh, outline there, verses 11 through 13. Let's read it together. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. I consider myself to be in that pastor and teacher category. One translation actually has a, a slash. It's pastor slash teachers. It's one and the same. That's my role. There are other roles of apostles and prophets and evangelists, but it's the role of those of us with that specialized calling to equip the rest of you for ministry. Um, I like to put it this way, and this is a corny thing that I get away with with every membership 101 class because they haven't heard me say it a gazillion times like some of you have. I'm paid to be good. You're good for nothing. I just, I love to get away with that. So um, my job is to help equip you to do the ministry. The old model was that we paid that pastor, and by darn, it's his job to do all the things. You know, what are we paying you for, pastor? Well, my job is to help prepare or equip you. Um, I, I like to remind the people in 101 class that the word for equip is the same word used in Matthew and Mark when Jesus met the disciples along the Sea of Galilee. The first four that, that are mentioned were all fishermen. And do you remember what were they doing when he called them? Anybody? They were mending their nets. They were cleaning the net. They'd been out fishing they were getting the nets ready for the next opportunity. It just happens that I have a net right here. And uh, my job is to make sure that the net is intact. Back in about 2000 or 2001, I had an old fishing net that I was sentimentally attached to that I'd use as a kid. But I made the mistake of having a pair of scissors in one hand and the net in the other. And I got carried away for the purpose of one service, one illustration. And I went snip, snip, snip. And I have that net. I don't have it here to show you today. I went to Walmart and bought this one. Uh, this is, you'd think this is a fish net. Well, I got to tell you, at Pine City, this is also a bat catching tool. And it, it, I've actually caught a few bats with this baby. There's some of you people that don't like bats. You know, I don't mind them that much. I kind of like bats. They're not, they're not bad things. But our church office manager, one week, I, I got, one day I got there and the doors closed. What's going on? Right over the drinking fountain, there's a bat. 
you know. So I knew where this was, and I just went and got Mr. Bat and took him outdoors, told her that he's outdoors. Didn't tell her that he's probably back in by the time I got back in, I guess. But my, I, I chased a little rabbit, not a bat, but a rabbit there. Um, my job is to make sure that our network is intact. If we're going to win people for the gospel of Jesus Christ, we need people who have Jesus at their center, just like each of these strands could represent Jesus. They're tied to Jesus, and so they're tied to each other. And then we're able to honor God with uh, an intact unity that makes all the difference in the world. Get it? Good. Let's pray. Help us, God, to keep the main thing, the main thing, to honor you and to keep our purpose right. And whatever the future holds, we know that you hold the future and that you will help us to keep our purpose central to our following Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.